Thanks so much, Jeff. That was a lovely introduction. And uh, holla at all my fellow first-timers, because this is also my first UI comp. Um, so I'm really excited to be at an event that I've heard so much good stuff about, and it's really an honor to kick things off this morning. And it's cool when you get invited to speak, because you get a lot more leeway in terms of what you talk about. So for this morning, I've prepared for you a talk about raccoons. Does anybody else love raccoons? <laughs> All right, give it time. I have like 30 minutes to change your mind. So <laughs> I'm at heart uh, an engineer, but like Jeff said, now I mainly run engineering teams. Um, and there are a lot of things that I love about my job, but I definitely miss writing code. Um, and so since the end of last year, I've been leading the mobile team at Automatic, uh, where we work mainly on WordPress. So it's a 28-person team, so things got super meta for me, because like, I manage managers now. Um, and when people talk about engineering management, they talk about herding cats. So, for example, here's a quote about engineering management. A man who carries a cat by the tail learns something he can learn no other way. Um, but Mark Twain is a little dated, because, you know, women can traumatize cats too now. Um, I really like to think about raccoons rather than cats, though, because raccoons are cuter, smarter, and more inclined to wash things. Um, but it is true that raccoons do what they feel, you know, and sometimes that's awesome. Like, look at this raccoon, right? Like, she is riding a crocodile, and frankly, I admire her so much. This raccoon is everything I want to achieve in life. Uh, and sometimes it's not awesome, so, like, this raccoon is stuck. Poor guy. Um, <laughs> But you know, this raccoon is really trying to live his best life because he is trying to break into a tank. You know, it's just quite hard to break into a tank. And so now he's stuck. And maybe all he needed was someone to say like, hey buddy, I get that you want to drive a tank because like obviously that would be awesome. Uh, but that hole is really pretty small and have you thought about riding a crocodile instead? And so when I was thinking about what to talk about, like, I wasn't sure if this was the right talk for you all, you know, because I bet you all get to write a lot more code than I do. So like, come and find me in the break and tell me what that's like. Um, but do something with me. If you've had a good manager, can you please stand up? <laughs> OK, great. And if you've been part of a high-performing team, can you please stand up? Uh, one thing I didn't think through is how this would go if your manager was here, so... Um, <laughs> right, now, if this has been the norm, please sit down, but if this, is, um, if this has been the norm, please stay standing up, and otherwise sit down. Okay, one person. Two? Three? All right. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the people standing up, like, maybe this talk isn't for you, but there are more excellent raccoon pictures. It is, I believe, worth staying for them alone. Um, and for the rest of you, this talk is for you, right? We work in a pretty dysfunctional industry, and it is really hard to find a great team in a healthy work environment. Um, but it's even harder when we don't really know what to look for, you know? I never got to be part of an inclusive team until I ran one. Um, and we make better decisions when we go towards something that we believe to be good than when we go away from something that we know to be bad. And so I'm hoping I can talk a bit about what a functional team looks like. And so you can push towards that in the teams you're on currently. Um, and when you look for what's next, you have some ideas about what to look for. So there are plenty of think pieces on the internet, I'm sure you've read a number, um, that will offer you a silver bullet to fix your engineering team. And for mobile teams, the silver bullets are normally React Native and Product Pods. Um, so Let's take a moment to talk about React Native and how it's probably not the answer to whatever problem your team is currently facing. I mean, if your problem is that you want to write your iOS very boilerplate UI code in JavaScript, it might be the answer. Um, <laughs> but otherwise, it's probably not, right? Because if you have anything interesting, you're most certainly going to have performance problems, especially on Android. So. Um, you know, React Native is a technical solution to a social problem, and it turns out Facebook has some very unique social problems, and those are probably not the answers for most of us. So I'm not going to offer you any silver bullets today. I'm going to talk about predictability, prioritization, connectedness, automation, and accountability, and raccoons. So. <laughs> 
that goes without saying. Um, a predictable team has a regular cadence, right? Um, you can set goals and expectations around th when things will happen. But one of the challenges we have on mobile is we ship compiled code. And most advice about improving team velocity is like, you just need continuous delivery. Just like ship as many times a day as you can. And if you break prod, just be like, YOLO. Um, <laughs> And so here's a really fun story about a simple mistake on an iOS build, um, because an early build of the much anticipated Gmail for iOS app broke notifications. And so this really annoying prompt would prop up constantly, which users couldn't do anything with. Um, and it ended up being pulled from the store. And so I'd worked on that team, not when they did that, uh, just to be clear. Uh, <laughs> and I sat next to them at the time, and so I have this like, visceral memory of that, because it's so terrible to have to pull your app from the store, you know? And that was 2011, and things have really improved since then. You know, we have better continuous integration. We know what is signed by with what certificate. And the app store is a lot better, too. You know, wait times are shorter. Um, you can expedite an emergency bug fix. In Google Play, we can even do staged rollout. Like, how have we been living without this? Um, but you can't roll back an app. And so with auto update, it's easy to think that everybody is getting the latest version. You know, and this is just not true. People can turn it off. They can be selective about when they update. They can even just go several days without connecting to Wi-Fi. Um, and we have to remember that the typical tech worker, you know, with their high-end device and like fast Wi-Fi at home and at work, it's not the norm. And the worst case scenario has got less bad, but ultimately it's still the same. Um, and there is no like, lol, that time I broke prod if you work on a client-side app, you know? There's a frantic patch and test and release cycle and the impatient waiting for the App Store while users that you would never normally hear for leave really vitriolic reviews, some of them offering physical violence. So one small mistake, several hours to fix, and months of trying to rebuild your App Store rating. And this is why a regular release cycle is so important but that it's not just about what goes into the, like, the deciding to ship on a certain time frame. It's about everything else that goes into it. So how do you build confidence in that release? What's your automated testing like? Do you have manual QA? Do you have internal users? Do they actually use your app? Do you have beta users? Do you actually talk to them? And can you commit to the release train? Because the thing that will most easily derail your release cycle is trying to stick things into it because you just don't want to wait until the next one. And this is why an effective release cycle is one, short, and two, rigid. Um, short because people are more willing to wait if they don't have to wait for long. And rigid because patching things in and hoping for the best just results in a delayed and buggy release. You might get away with that like once or twice, uh, but not every time. And ultimately, when you break the rules, you undermine them. And finally, you have to be willing to kick things off the release train. You know, feature flags are great, but you have to be willing to say about something that is causing problems in the alpha or FSM forbid the beta, this is not ready to launch yet, and it will have to wait until next time. So a common complaint about mobile teams is that they're slower. And mainly I found this isn't actually about writing code being slower. It's about releasing it to the world being slower. Because even with a very rigid two-week release cycle, something can be around, code can be around for up to a month before it finally makes it out into the world. You know, a PR review takes a little longer. It misses the release train. You've got to wait two more weeks. And so a regular release cycle means that you can communicate when these changes will be out in the world. And a regular release cycle means that leadership and users um, will see improvements regularly. And even if it's not the one they really want, they'll be more inclined to believe it's coming. So I don't really believe in deadlines. <laughs> Um, I believe in prioritization, scope, and regular releases. And I do believe in goals, because an effective team can set themselves goals and meet them. And it's really hard to achieve goals surrounded by chaos, and this is why the rhythm of a regular release cycle is really helpful. And beyond that, prioritizing what's most important and why, and scoping what's a unit of measurable improvement, these go a long way. So these things are not rocket science, but they require much of the discipline required to make a release cycle regular, like a commitment to the realistic and a willingness to say no. So a team that's clear on priorities, like when you ask them what's important and why they can answer, it's amazing how rarely people can actually do this, um, 
And you know, one challenge we have on mobile is that le company leadership, they tend to be dominated by iOS users. And so Android can sometimes feel like a bit of an afterthought. You all might be OK with that, but like the Androids on my team are not, you know? Um, so if you ask a person on your team what is your top priority as a team, can they tell you? And can they tell you why? Can they tell you how their work fits into it, or if it doesn't? And do your actions and the actions of the leadership, do they align with that top priority? Um, and do the team priorities align with the company priorities? The challenge of team priorities is often not deciding what they should be, right? But deciding what should come first and being consistent in your actions so that it aligns with that. So a sustainable product has both growth and retention. And because mobile is growing and desktop is declining, your mobile experience, and this includes the web too, really needs to effectively onboard new users. But app downloads are declining. Um, and so I feel like the era of like that, there's an app for that is over because like of course there's an app for that, but does it deserve to take up space on my phone? And the users who install your app on their device and use it regularly, these are your most engaged users. They have made it past onboarding and they've figured out what it's for. And so how do you maintain that engagement? Um, and one thing is looking at if there's anything broken that might drive people away. You know, different products have different priorities, um, but it's important to consider both your new user experience and your existing user experience. Over time, to be sustainable, you have to balance both. If you onboard people into a bad experience, you will drive them away and they will never come back. But you do need to focus on your onboarding process in order to grow. So there are two apps that I've abandoned for cause. <laughs> and I resent it. Um, <laughs> I'm still holding a grudge. And both of them are gamification apps. Um, and the same thing that happened on both of them, they lost my streak. So I had a Nike Fuel that had a hardware failure, and a Duolingo like, offline didn't work, and it lost my 100 like, days to speak in Spanish. No bueno. Um, and so another example of that is actually WordPress. Uh, years before I worked at Automatic, and I lost a blog post when I was trying to write one on my iPad. And I was taking notes in a talk, so there was just like no way to get it back. And I like never forgave it. I stopped using the app, and I switched to using a notes app and Simple Note instead. Um, and so people complain a lot, and technology is fallible. But whatever your product, you have to understand what your UX catastrophe is. And for a writing app, it is absolutely content loss. And for gamification, I think it's kind of unfair losing. But what should come first? You know, what comes first is a balance between company, team, various possible forces, um, new users, existing users, money, growth. Um, they can only be one top priority, but that doesn't mean that the team only works on one thing. Every team has to balance maintenance and future work, but you need to carve out the space for your top priorities such that people actually work on it and it actually gets shipped. You can't say no to everything that isn't number one, but you have to say no enough that number one actually happens. And priorities need to be communicated frequently with reasons and progress. You know? And you communicate priorities not just by what you say about what is the priority, but when you say no to things um, and in how you spend your time. I like to use data to tell a story. So if you can measure something, then you can use that measurement as an indicator of success. Uh, but since you manage what you measure, like, I like to have two metrics to make it less easy to game. So top priority on my team right now, we have two metrics that we're looking at. One is user success rate in this action, and the other one is support volume from users trying to achieve this action. And the two units, these two numbers show up every time we discuss it. Um, and user testing videos of users struggling to complete this action, these round out the numbers, and they help engineers empathize with the problem and the people it affects. So you also have to align your actions with priorities. I started managing a designer for the first time ever pretty recently, and like, I had no idea how to manage a designer, so guess what? I got it wrong. Um, and the way I got it wrong was that I was like, can you just like, look at this little visual thing? You know? Um, and <laughs> it turned out that the things that I thought were the design equivalent of code review were not the design equivalent of code review. And so I kind of paid attention. I was like, wow, this is like a lot more involved than I thought it would be. Um, and he also was like, hey, you're really stressing me out. Um, so <laughs> we like aligned his work better so that he could focus on his top priority. And you know, the, a lot of the other things just have to wait for a while. One thing that can be a challenge for mobile teams in particular is that Android is the largest in growth platform. Um, so this is 2015 to 2016. Um, Android grew by 7% and iOS declined by 11%. 
Um, but depending on what you're building in your market, Android might not be your biggest platform. If you're building an app for rich people, maybe in React Native. Um, <laughs> But it's definitely an important one, right? But tech company leadership dominated by iOS users. So it doesn't matter how much you talk about Android being, and being important. If you only use the iOS app, no one will believe you. So connected team. You know, people work together, and they take an interest in each other. And this really doesn't mean that everybody has to be friends, but it does mean that they're friendly. Um, and I think one of the problems we have on mobile is that we lack this clear model for mobile infrastructure. And so we have these like endless discussions about like, oh, should we have product pods? Um, but like, regardless of what your mobile team looks like, um, a product pods, uh, like a mobile team, some like new configuration that has not yet been think pieced on medium, uh, you have a challenge of connection. And in a dedicated mobile team, how do mobile engineers connect with engineers working on front end features? Um, or do engineers developing the API? Was the API written with mobile in mind, or does it work on someone else's machine? And often the answer to this is like, you just need to have product parts. And like, to be fair, people have been known to build an API that actually works for mobile that way. Um, but a good app is not just a collection of features. It is an architected thing that has some components that are shared throughout. You know, some notion of user identity, networking, a database layer, um, and ideally, it ha follows some standards patterns that, I'm going to get really radical here, are possible to write unit and integration tests for. Um, <laughs> it's also going to need to be mindful of memory management, because mobile is a constrained experience, not just by screen size. So this is a joke about microservices. And so the first raccoon says, I split the application up into seven microservices. And the second raccoon says, so you have seven teams that hate each other. Um, and I, this is not a good way to run any team, but there is no microservices architecture for mobile other than maybe splitting your app into seven different apps because the teams don't like each other. But <laughs> so regardless of your configuration, you know, people are going to have to, uh, once again, I'm getting really revolutionary, talk to each other. And when you organize teams to better facilitate some kind of communication, you, know, you make the other kind harder. And since you know, we don't have this microservices architecture, there's no ways for one team's architectural decisions not to affect the rest of the people working on that application. Bonus, we're still evolving our patterns and standards. You know? um, so there's not really currently the concept of a mobile infrastructure engineer. And great mobile engineers are normally pretty product focused. Um, so you know, how's that move to Viper going? How much of your app is written in Swift? And how's that networking layer that y'all wrote four years ago working out for you? So let me ask, behind schedule, around half, uh, not so well, we don't like to talk about it. But we can't make people like each other. So what are we going to do? Well, the best way to get two teams to fight is to give them conflicting incentives. So if you incentivize one team to like ship as many features as you can as fast as possible, and you incentivize another team to like maintain zero crashes, then you can like sit back with some popcorn and like watch the show. <laughs> um, but if you incentivize like one team to like move some metrics about user engagement and happiness, and another team to like maintain sustainable execution, then it'll probably be like a little less like robot wars and a little more like a functional work environment. If your app is badly architected, everyone will pay for that every day. Um, if your networking code is a mess, it will bleed through your entire application. So if you invest in the things that make everyone more productive, then you know everyone will probably be more productive. Um, <laughs> Things are harder to explain to like business and product people, but every team should have some maintenance time, and the thing is to be very strategic about how you use it. And you know, you need to build a team. Like the easiest way to build relationships is to unite against a common enemy. And this is a short-term strategy and not conducive to long or medium-term good work environments. Um, amazingly, this is news to some people. Uh, but your team is not just the one denoted by the org chart. A team is a group of people who work together to achieve a shared goal. So ignore the org chart for a moment and think about something you're trying to achieve. Who is on your team? Who do you need on your team to be successful? And now reach out to them. So let's talk about automation. So this maybe seems like an out of place thing in this talk, because like prioritize, connected, accountable, like all these fuzzy people things, but like automation sounds like proper developer work, like much more fun, right? But you know, think of automation as like documentation, but developers will actually write it. 
Without automation, it's really easy to have random esoteric things that like, very few people know how to do. Um, it's much harder for others to take over processes like builds. You know? A lot of time is either spent on manual processes that are really straightforward to reproduce, um, and then either bugs are missed because like, it's boring um, and inconsistent, or it takes time that could be better spent on other things. So what can we automate? Automate builds for the love of all holy things, automate your build. Like, if you commit to a predictable release cycle, you'll end up investing in automation in order to make this happen, because otherwise it's just too painful. Um, and this can be kind of like a chicken and the egg problem. Like, you're like, we should have regular releases. And someone's like, but we need to automate all these things. Pro tip, nothing encourages people to automate all the things and saying, yeah, let's just like commit to the release cycle, and it will be horrible until we automate these things. Um, write tests. You know, I really cannot believe that in 2017 I'm still trying to convince people that tests are important, although frankly there's a lot of things I can't really believe about 2017. <laughs> um, so <laughs> one of my current work hobbies is like noticing GitHub threads with like very standard testing steps for reviewers and commenting, this would make a good automated test. Other common GitHub comments for me are, please write some tests, and I like these tests. It's important to give positive reinforcement, you know? Um, <laughs> And so I just need to note that with testing, it's not just a question of writing the test, but also having an architecture that makes writing tests possible. Linting. Style guides, right? The purpose of a style guide is so that you never discuss it again. All right? I once witnessed a centi-thread argument about whether it should be var equals equals const or const equals equals var. Like, who has the time to have that kind of argument? Apparently, I worked with a lot of people who did. Um, <laughs> And like, you can automate your style guide so your IDE applies it and that your code review tool applies it um, and so that your reviewers don't have to. When code review is done well, it is a great collaboration tool. Um, in a dysfunctional environment, it is the first place that conflict will show up. And one positive, but let's be clear, insufficient step towards productive code review is eliminating nonsense arguments about spacing. So tooling on mobile is still behind, but it is getting better. And things can be a bit more painful to set up, but if you make the time, it does pay off. Um, but part of it is having that time. You know, When everything is super frantic, there's no time to automate painful things to make them less painful. And the anti-pattern of automation is over-automation. You know, I'm sure you've worked with people, maybe been that person, um, who crafts some elaborate system that only they can use to solve some minor problem that only they can see. Um, and pragmatically with automation, taking the things that are most painful and most tedious um, and hard to socialize parts is a great place to start. So on an accountable team, people can have expectations of each other, and this includes leadership. Um, but you know, all the other things that we've talked about often result in mobile being a bit disconnected. You know, server-side changes can break clients. Mobile developers take the heat from users and from leadership. And this can lead to resentment, you know, which makes accountability really hard. And accountability comes last because it builds on everything else. Um, being erratic undermines accountability because the chaos can always be blamed. Um, lack of prioritization undermines accountability because who's to say what actually was most important? Um, and on a disconnected non-team, you know, who even is accountable and what for? Um, and the less the team is automated, the more crucial but repetitive things can really fall through the cracks. If you want to hold someone accountable, though, assuming you're not a sociopath, it needs to be clear what you're holding them accountable for. But you individually holding people accountable doesn't scale. You know? In a healthy team, people will hold themselves and each other accountable to their team. Um, so I want to tell you a story about the worst manager I ever had. Um, and because he like hid deadlines and like concealed missing information, and uh, you'll be shocked to hear that the product and team was eventually killed. But you know, one time I told him I was worried because we'd missed this deadline, and he said, "What deadline? There was no deadline. That was a deadline. Okay." Um, <laughs> he made it impossible for other people in the team to know what was going on because he thought people should only talk to him and anything else was gossiping. Um, and so no one on the team could hold anyone else accountable because no one knew what was going on. And so it was really kind of farcical, but the best way to tell that there was a deadline is that the tech lead on the team would disappear. So like one time he disappeared for three days to search for a cat. Um, <laughs> 
we had this meeting, which was like a post-mortem about why this team was a disaster and couldn't ship anything. Um, and the tech lead, like, he made some subtle digs at like another dude on the team, and then he said something super inappropriate to me. Um, and there was this uncomfortable silence. Of course, a lot of people came up to me afterwards to be like, wow, that wasn't cool. But, you know, in the moment, they stayed quiet. And my manager was in that meeting, but he did not handle it, you know? So I was like, I wasn't okay with that, and I was like hoping he would deal with it, uh, but he didn't. He said, oh, well, you should tell him. And I was like, okay. Um, and this is probably what we should expect from a guy who dealt with deadlines by pretending they didn't exist. And he didn't say that about anything else ever. This was the first time I'd been encouraged to talk to that dude. So I got this dude one-on-one, -on -one and I was like, I told him everything he'd done to annoy me in the previous six months. I told him why what he'd just done was super inappropriate, and I shared with him my conclusion, which is he had no leadership skills. And so you may be surprised to know that this did not go well. <laughs> yeah, and so in my defense, I was right. <laughs> like this guy spent four months reinventing how to architect an Android application, and eight months shipping um, something which, for the whole time that was happening, included this thing of two weeks of UI polish. Anyway, and <laughs> and when you know this, the team he ran was a disaster, and when that was clear, he disappeared to three, for three days to search for a cat. <laughs> right, like. Somebody really needed to tell him that he was terrible at his job. Um, but I was not the right person to do that. You know, firstly, I was a ball of rage, so I gave him feedback he was never going to listen to. Um, <laughs> and secondly, I was trying to hold him accountable for something that he hadn't agreed to be accountable for on a team with no norms or culture of accountability. And so this isn't how you start building a culture of accountability. You know, it's not where you go, wow, I don't want to deal with that. We should have some peer accountability in here. Uh, that is not how you do it. You have to start smaller, and it really starts with holding yourself accountable. Um, when we move into leadership, uh, it's really easy for our work to become less visible. And the output is the team. It's no longer our individual work. Um, and good leadership and management are a lot of work, but often in this nebulous way that's hard to quantify. Um, if our work is too visible, it's probably a sign that we're either doing the wrong things or we're taking too much credit for the work done by the whole team. And often we demonstrate accountability one-on-one. -on -one. You know, we schedule one-on-ones and we show up to them. And we listen to what people say and we follow up on it, even if we can't fix problems right away. So now my work is more meta, I write an internal blog post every week where I share the things that I've spent time on and sometimes the less concrete things that I'm just thinking about. Uh, when I was a manager of ICs, I would just post my standard every day, same as everyone else. And sometimes it's just like one-on-ones in code review. <laughs> um, but I find being transparent about how I spend my time goes a long way, um, even if my outputs are less concrete. Um, and you can't make somebody hold themselves accountable, but you can encourage accountability. Um, I think stand-up is such a great way to do this. Um, and I really love writing stand-ups in Slack because it doesn't depend on everyone being around at the same time. And, you know, if someone forgets what they thought was important in the morning, they can always scroll back later. Um, stand-up forces some people to start their day with some kind of intention about what they want to achieve. Um, and, you know, you can also, like, ask people what they hope to achieve in a given period and then see how that goes. Um, and, you know, giving people the, surf the opportunity to surface the things that don't go to plan is really important. You know, inviting accountability by asking questions before giving feedback or assigning blame is really helpful because it's much more powerful when someone owns up to what they need to do better than when you tell them. And so code review done well is such a good entry point into peer accountability because this is when people look at each other's work and give each other feedback and ask hard questions. Um, but how do you get accountability outside of code review? Well, a lot of that is about encouraging a non-judgmental space where people can be open about what's not going to plan. Um, there is nothing more toxic to a culture of accountability than blame, um, because only when people feel like they can own up and they can ask questions of each other without seeming judgmental uh, will they actually do so. So the big thing I want you to take away is this idea of thinking in the medium term. Um, Short-term thinking comes back to bite us very quickly, and long-term thinking optimizes for a future that we're probably never going to get to. 
A lot of what we've covered here is like this mindful investment in the important rather than perfection of everything and in what we build and how we go about it. Um, it's also about doing the hard thing. So there's no silver bullets because a team is a complex system and everything affects everything else. Um, so I'm going to close with two observations that I regularly make to new managers who complain to me. Um, and the first is, congratulations on not being a sociopath. I give A++ advice, y'all. Um, so a lot of like, hard things, like hard conversations, hard decisions where you have to disappoint somebody, like they are hard, and there's a limit to how easy they should be. Um, if things are hard, it doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't be doing them. It might just mean that you're not a sociopath. And the second is, this is why most teams are dysfunctional. Uh, because most people don't do this work. Um, and so this has been a soft talk. I really hate that phrasing because humans are so much harder than machines and also more inclined to stab you. Um, it has also been a works on my machine talk, you know, because the thing I have not even begun to touch upon here is the work I've done on myself um, to be someone who can serve my team to this extent. Coaching, mentors, the amount of time I spend in the gym, it is emotionally hard and really draining. Um, and the easiest way to set yourself up for failure is to not take care of yourself so that you can't do it over the medium term. So healthy teams are made of healthy people. And so we take care of ourselves so that we can take care of each other because together we can ride a whole family of crocodiles or at least steal a car. Thank you. So speaking of hard things done together, organizing a conference is a tremendous amount of work, much of it to ensure things that hopefully you'll never notice. Um, so can we have some more applause for the organizers who put so much work into creating this great event? Thank you.